where did prophecy kind of come from? We've been working on it for quite a long time. Uh, obviously, the preceding range of speakers with the 25i uh, speakers. We knew that we wanted to upgrade those speakers in as many ways as possible. We've been working on a lot of new technologies in the background and developing on a uh, previous existing technology. So is it more of an evolution rather than a revolution? Or was this a ground up design? It was a totally ground up design. So entirely new transmission line designs, okay. entirely new drive units for the, our domestic market. Uh, the tweeter actually is used in some of our studio monitors as well. Okay. So really emphasising that from studio to home thing. Sure. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, as I say, just in incorporating a lot of new technologies that we've been developing. Hi there, it's Alan from Lloyd & Clear Glasgow. I am delighted to be joined today by Toby Ridley, who's one of the principal acoustic and R&D engineers from PMC Loudspeakers. Uh, we're going to be talking about the brand new Prophecy um, series of loudspeakers from PMC. Toby, can you give us, for those who don't know PMC, um, can you give us a little bit of background on, on who you are and where you came from? Yeah, sure. Well, as a company, we've been around for quite a while. Uh, the company was founded in 1991, I think, by Peter Thomas and Adrian Loder. Uh, Peter was a ex, well, at the time was managing studios at the BBC. And Adrian was working, I don't actually exactly know where he was working, but in the sort of audio industry as well, uh, and technology industry. And they both sort of decided that there was a lack of very high resolution studio monitors that also could do very high SPL that uh, was being demanded in these studios. You had sort of had one or the other. They either sounded very, would go loud, but be pretty harsh, or they could sound really good, but they had no output capabilities. And so they just got to tinkering in their back gardens and uh, designing some uh, new ideas and some new speakers, uh, all based around transmission line technology, which is okay. and has always been our core technology. And then, yeah, they sold their first set of speakers to the BBC. Uh, which they then remained there for 25 odd years and which, uh, when we eventually replaced them with the new model of that uh, same speaker and we've now yeah, become a very large player in both the studio market and the home audio market. We have a huge, uh, a huge presence in yeah, recording studios all around the world, TV, film, game design, that sort of uh, industry. And then also, yeah, we split into the home markets as well. So we do about 50-50. Is that about 50-50? Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I don't know the exact, the exact figures, but yeah, roughly the, the, our focus is split 50-50. Okay. And okay. Uh, one thing that we've always really, really tried to focus on is making sure that our domestic speakers are voiced the same as our studio monitors. So we have a real ethos of from, from the studio to the home where we want... Uh, we want our customers to be really confident that if a piece of content they're listening to was mixed on PMC speakers, if you're listening to it at home on our PMC speakers as well, then you're having the exact same experience as the recording engineer was having, okay. minus the room being yeah, the same. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have with us the stand mount from mm -hmm. the Prophecy series. Um, where did Prophecy kind of come from? Um, we've been working on it for quite a long time. Uh, obviously, the preceding range of speakers was the 25i yeah. uh, speakers, which we spoke about uh, re the last time I was here. Absolutely. Um, we knew that we wanted to upgrade those speakers in as many ways as possible. We've been working on a lot of new technologies in the background and developing on a, a previous existing technologies. So it really was just a case of looking at the 25i series and saying, where can we improve things? Uh, there's new styling cues as well, so how can we update the line to make it look a bit more modern and a bit more sort okay. of sleek? So is it more of an evolution rather than a revolution? Or was this a ground up design? It was a totally ground up design, so entirely new transmission line designs, okay. entirely new drive units for the, our domestic market. Uh, the tweeter actually is used in some of our studio monitors as well, okay. so really emphasising that from studio to home thing. Yeah, sure. okay. um, and then, yeah, as I say, just in incorporating a lot of new technologies that we've okay. been developing. So, so. yeah, so on that that basis then what are the kind of key what are the key technologies within the new speakers then? Sure well obviously the key one which is uh, common to all PMC loudspeakers is the advanced transmission line uh, technology so that's the base loading principle that we use in all of our speakers. Okay uh, so Can you give us a little bit of background on that I know we've done some more yeah, detailed yeah, no, content on this, but if you can give us a little bit of background and advice. Definitely. So more. it's a bit more complicated than either a sealed or a ported speaker, which is traditionally what you see in most uh, speakers around the world. Um, so what you have is inside the cabinet, there's a long tunnel behind the bass driver, uh, which then exits at the vent, which uh, is somewhere on the speaker. And uh, the tunnel is filled with acoustic foams, which are quite highly specified and take a lot of time to uh, carefully place and, and figure out exactly where they should be and what thickness they should be. And what happens with the tunnel is that it's 
a very specific length, a very specific set of dimensions that tunes it to a certain frequency. And it's like, it's a pipe resonance. Instead of being like a Helmholtz resonance in a ported speaker, it's a quarter wave pipe resonance. Basically, the length of the line is related to one quarter wavelength of the frequency you want to tune it to. Just by the physics of how a transmission line works and the pipe resonance, it's a lower key resonance than a ported speaker, which means it's a, a broader resonance, less peaky, yeah. which means you get a smoother bass response with um, less of that one note bass that you can sometimes hear. So it's yeah. very well damped, very well controlled bass, yeah. okay. and it also extends really, really deep for the length. So, so what that effectively there. lets you do is get lower frequency base exactly, yeah. from, a, from a smaller enclosure. So you can have a small stand, stand mount like this that will get down to sort of 40 and below hertz uh, yeah. with authority, okay. uh, very high efficiency. So uh, around the tuning frequency of the, uh, of the transmission line, what you find is the air inside the line does all sorts of strange uh, acoustic behaviors. Uh, it becomes quite stiff and the air sort of couples to the back of the drive unit cone and sort of mm -hmm. stops the drive unit moving. Mm -hmm. And uh, around those frequencies, all the energy comes out of the transmission line vent. Uh, and as I say, it's a very broad resonance. So it's over a large range of frequencies you get this effect where the bass driver isn't really moving much. All the energy is coming through this really well damped transmission line. Yeah, okay. uh, so that massively increases your headroom there because you can move, push so much more power to that bass driver. It can, without it having to reach its end stops or, yeah. or over excursion or anything like that to get a lot more output. So it improves power handling as well. Yeah, and there's nice other benefits as well. So because it's a, a very well damped tunnel that all this energy is going through, if you think about a bass driver, uh, typically, well, if you think about a bass driver, it's moving forwards and backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the energy that's being radiated forwards is also being radiated backwards into the cabinet. So if you have a two-way speaker, for instance, like this, that bass driver is playing up to sort of one and a half, two kilohertz uh, before it's really, really heavily rolling off. So you've got one and a half, two kilohertz and down playing into the cabinet. Mm -hmm. Now, that energy doesn't just go in and disappear. It, it's bouncing around inside the cabinet normally, and, and then eventually, in a normal cabinet, it will find its way back out through the cone as a reflected sound that's slightly delayed, and you can see these sort of dips and peaks on the frequency response if you look closely, where you're seeing this reflected sound coming out. In our transmission line speakers, that reflected energy goes down this long, damped pathway. Mm -hmm. And because of all the acoustic foams inside there, the high, mid and high frequency energy gets absorbed yeah. and it just disappears, basically. So you get this massive reduction in mid-range distortion. So you get really, really clear mids, really, really clear highs that are completely un, uh, unfiltered by this extra distortion layer. Um, yeah, so yeah, a, a remarkable technology. We're constantly working on yeah. it. And, uh, and constantly refining that. Constantly refining yeah. it, yeah. So it's an endless task, really. Yeah, quite, quite. Uh, yeah. So the next development of the ATL that we've really put into, or sorry, the advanced transmission line we've put into Prophecy Series specifically is uh, a development of our laminaire technology. Yeah. So it's a technology we originally introduced actually in one of our studio models, the QB1 main monitor, so massive, massive speakers. And it's to do with controlling the uh, behavior of the airflow in and out of the cabinet. So okay. Around the tuning frequency of a transmission line speaker, you start getting really high air velocity uh, in and out of the speaker at the vent. Yeah. Uh, when you get high air velocity through a tube, you start getting turbulent flow instead of nice laminar yeah. flow where all the air is moving in the same direction at the same speed. Uh, now that turbulence is noticeable because it starts forming high frequency noise. You can hear it as a sort of whistly chuffing noise that we're quite familiar with in speakers. Um, so that kind of port noise that you would you would associate with. Yeah, exactly. And the louder you play it, the more that gets because yeah. the air velocity gets higher and higher. Yeah. Um, so what Laminaire does, uh, it splits the vent exit into multiple small fins. Which is kind of counterintuitive. You would imagine that yeah. more fins, you would increase the turbulence. Yeah, so it's uh, it, you would. It, it sort of looks like, well, we're getting smaller channels. And if you yeah. try and put air through a small channel, then it somehow will make it more turbulent. But you've got to you counteract that sort of small channels by having more open area in general, so you have the same overall total surface area yeah, okay. for the airflow. But basically, it's to do with um, fluid dynamics. It's, I don't want to go too far into the sure. numbers, but there's a, uh, a characteristic called the Reynolds number. And it turns out that by splitting a channel into multiple smaller channels, you decrease the Reynolds number, which yeah. is uh, a unitless uh, number that describes how likely a, a system is to be laminar or turbulent. Yeah and it just makes the system more likely to be laminar for okay. a given flow rate. Um, so that was the original concept. Uh, we're getting really into it here. Uh, the, advancement, the advancement that we've done on uh, the laminar 
which we now call laminar X to sort of denote it as the next sure. stage on, uh, is we really started looking into the fine tuning of this technology and specifically with regards to how many fins we're putting in mm -hmm. uh, and also how long the fins are. So previously we were sort of looking at how many fins, mm -hmm. now we're really focusing on, focusing on how long they are. So there's a second term uh, that we've been paying attention to which is called the hydrodynamic entry length. Okay. So that's a lovely one to be thinking about. I okay. dream about it at night. Um, and that is to do with, so if you think about any fluid system, let's think about a river, right? Mm -hmm. Let's take a tree in the middle of this river. Mm -hmm. uh, the water hits the tree. Yep. That's the boundary. And then it's going to take a certain amount of time after it's hit this tree for the water flow to settle down again afterwards. You'll get a bit of turbulence as it goes around the tree. It's the same thing with the air going past, say, a laminaire vent. As it enters the laminaire vent, you're hitting, hitting an acoustic boundary and it will introduce some small amount of turbulence. Mm -hmm. Now, the net effect with a laminaire vent is still a benefit. You're still reducing turbulence and increasing laminaire flow. But what we found is if you have quite a short laminaire vent, the turbulence hasn't had time to settle down before it exits the vent. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting as much of a benefit as actually you could get. Okay. So now what we're playing around with is and we're doing really extensive uh, FEA simulations and uh, to, to sort of exactly characterize this and, and figure out exactly how it should be, how long it should be. Um, but yeah, we're making the parts specifically long enough that we know that at any output level the speaker is capable of, the airflow has then set, settled down again before it, before it exits and yeah. you get uh, the yeah. maximum benefit from the laminaire vent. The effect of it is that we get cleaner base because we've not got this whistling, this chuffing. It's more efficient actually because turbulent flow doesn't transmit energy very well. So mm -hmm. if you get that air nice and smooth, you get a better mm -hmm. energy, energy transfer. And uh, yeah, so you can play louder, cleaner bass okay. from our cabinets, which is always nice. Excellent, okay. So, and it's obviously a bit of a kind of design cue um, yeah. in these speakers as obviously well. Obviously there's really lots nice, of ways you can so style it. a really it. nice kind of finish. Defin no, you're excellent. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, there's lots of ways we can style it, but we wanted to make a real feature of it. Absolutely. And actually, one thing that's quite important, especially on our floor standing models for these range, is it's milled, uh, well, extruded actually out of a solid uh, block yeah. of aluminium, so it's and really it's quite heavy. Chunky as well. Yeah. So it's it actually helps stabilise yeah. the speakers. So we don't have to have outriggers or anything like that yeah. on the speakers. It stabilises the speakers. Which certainly means on the floor standards, you've got a top nice, plate, elegant, elegant cabinet as well without yeah the kind of style of, it, a, yeah. of a plinth. Yeah. It's got a nice low centre of gravity. It doesn't fall Good. over, and as you say, I think it looks quite elegant. So yeah, yeah we're quite happy with that. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, okay. the, that's Laminar X. The next thing we've really focused on is uh, waveguides, so dispersion yep. control. So for PMC, one of our core ethos, core, core, core sort of uh, design goals has always been to have wide, smooth, even dispersion. So if you remember when we were talking about 25i series previously, we were achieving the best possible smooth off-axis response by lowering the crossover frequency to mm -hmm. really low frequencies. Yeah. So, I mean, just to quickly recap on the reason we do that, any drive unit, as you play it higher and higher in frequency, its dispersion goes from very wide and starts yeah. gradually narrowing. Um, and that frequency where it starts getting really narrow at is related to how wide the drive unit is. Mm -hmm. So if you have a small drive unit, it's going to narrow at a higher frequency than a large driver, which will start narrowing at a lower frequency. So what we want it to do is match the dispersion of the tweeter or mid mid range with the woofer mm -hmm. um, around the crossover frequency. Make sure that they're as evenly matched as possible and yep. have the same angle of dispersion. Okay. Uh, so, so if you were setting off axis, you would be less aware of where the crossover exactly, point was between the two drivers. Exactly, because if you uh, don't get that right, what you find is that your woofer dispersion starts really wide, it's getting yep. narrower and narrower and narrower. You cross over to your tweeter, which then suddenly has a much wider yep. dispersion. Yep. So if you're sitting off axis, you have a frequency response that gets starts drooping and then suddenly spikes back up again where the tweeter comes in. You yeah. don't want that. Yeah. What we want is the same neutral frequency response at Whatever all, you're yeah. all the positions, yeah. precisely. So yeah, as I say, previously we were pushing the cro crossover frequency lower and lower and lower in frequency mm -hmm. to try and make sure that we have that really good match between the woofer and the tweeter, and that works. Mm -hmm. But you do run into a point where you start limiting your power handling because you're running your tweeter really, really yeah, low yeah. in frequency and it just can't move enough air. So the other way to control that uh, get around this issue is to add a waveguide to the tweeter, which we've done in this nice part here. Yep. Um, and that controls the dispersion from the tweeter, so it actually slightly narrows the dispersion at the lowest frequencies, but okay. it also, if you're very careful with the design of it, 
also can extend the dispersion at the very highest frequencies and make it even across the whole bandwidth so it doesn't go wide to narrow it just stays completely even no matter where you are yeah. uh, so we've very carefully designed this waveguide it provides a bit of acoustic loading as well so mm -hmm. it slightly bumps up the sensitivity at low frequencies yeah. which is great because it's more power handling yeah. um, and then yeah it's controlling the dispersion really nicely and allowing it to really really well match with the woofer now yeah. and you can see it on measurements it's unbelievably even as you go off axis yeah. uh, even yeah. compared to our old designs okay. uh, the secondary thing that you see is the new uh, dispersion grill mm -hmm. and uh, one uh, one thing you often see with waveguided tweeters is they can tend to have a slight drop off um, in frequency response right at the top of their response okay. so that the tweeter itself might have a very flat response then you put the waveguide on it gets a little bit of a boost at low frequencies and then you actually get a slight loss of energy at the high frequencies yeah. this grill uh, it's very, very carefully designed. You'll notice that there's some slightly filled in parts. It's not all completely mm -hmm. open. Uh, and what it does is it just loads the tweeter slightly at very high frequencies acoustically, and it just tilts that response yeah, back yeah, up again at the top yeah. end. So we get a really extended flat response okay. as well as the benefits of the waveguide itself. So it's a really, really nice solution. Okay. And then uh, the final thing you might notice here is uh, the slightly strange uh, shaped uh, waveguide on the mid-range drivers on yeah. our three-way models. So we call this Encompass, and it's something that we have used across a few different product lines. It's on uh, some of our midfield and small range uh, studio monitors, uh, which are used across the world. And um, yeah, it's a bit of an odd design. It's actually incorporating two separate waveguide profiles. So there's an exponential waveguide profile and a hyperbolic waveguide profile, if we want to be specific. Um, but what they offer is two, two different benefits. We found during development, the I mean, I'd say the steeper and the shallower one, it's easier to yeah. point to. But the steeper profile here, these sort of bulges that come in, if you had a waveguide just of that profile, it gave mm -hmm. really good acoustic loading, so good sensitivity at lower frequencies, mm -hmm. but it didn't give the best off-axis performance. The shallower one was giving really good off-axis performance, but not as much loading. So it was one of those sort of like, oh, what if we just try and do both? Yeah. Uh, and actually we found that you can get some of the benefits of both, the sort okay. of merge, uh, and uh, it worked well. And it also looks unique and yeah, quite interesting, it does, yeah. so it's quite Absolutely. cool. Great. So that's uh, Encompass. Purpose. Okay, excellent, excellent. So that's probably the end of the dramatically new technologies for us okay. or the new things. But as with all speakers, then you have to bring it all together with a crossover. Mm -hmm. So we've got our new crossovers. This is one from our three way products. I don't know exactly which speaker, but uh, yeah, probably the Prophecy 9, I believe, on that one. Um, yeah, as always with all of our speakers, we spend probably the most time during development on crossovers. And that's not to say we haven't spent an awful lot of time on everything else. It's Indeed. many, yeah. many years in the making the Prophecy series. Um, but yeah, for us, the most important thing is voicing and yeah. getting just that neutral sound. So hours and hours and hours spent just replacing tiny little bits and moving the crossover points just by one notch yeah. each way. You know, um, We start with simulations and measurements and then we fine tune by ear and just nonstop measure, listen, measure, yeah, listen until yeah. you get it right. And then there's the whole thing of even further fine tuning, you've got all the placement of the components on the board, yep. making sure that they're not interacting with each other in negative ways because inductors like to ring with each other and couple yep. magnetically, uh, and then choosing where does an air, where sounds better with an air yep. core inductor. Some places sound, might sound better with a steel laminate inductor, uh, choosing the right components for the capacitors, choosing the right brand, the right model, and things like that. So we try hundreds, hundreds, thousands of permutations of these things and. Sure. Uh, settle on hopefully the right, Absolutely. what we think is the best possible solution. So yeah, we're really proud of the crossovers Great. and ultra thick boards because it feels can. good. Yeah, <laughs> it feels good in the hand. That's great. So yeah, that, that sort of basically covers most of the technologies, I think. Yeah. Great. Um, great talk. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.